Coming to you from the crossroads of the Ozarks, this is PID Radio. Welcome, I'm Derek Gilbert. I am Sharon Gilbert, and we're delighted that you've chosen to join us once again in our barn, and we are grateful for each and every one of you who made this possible. Absolutely. We could not do this without your support, and uh, that is a just something we give thanks for every single day. But this th- having this dedicated space, rather than having to do it in a... Uh, uh, shoehorned into a bedroom yeah, is, is, is truly we a blessing. We, we did that for many years. We started the podcast in the in the bedroom and in the basement and then mm-hmm. the attic mm-hmm. and on, uh, uh, on when the we were Mechanic on, Street. Yes, yeah. I know in Shelbyville. That was that was a great house. But this is this barn. Everyone who walks into it is shocked. Mm-hmm. It's from the outside. It it's unassuming. That's fine. We don't care. But mm-hmm. uh, inside, it's very functional and. You have made it possible, so we thank you for that. You can find a, a link if you're if you're led to support us. That's mm-hmm. great. If not, your prayers are what we we need most of all, yep. and we Help do appreciate us keep those. the lights on. That kind of thing. Amen yeah. to that. So we appreciate your prayers. We also appreciate your prayers for our friends in Israel right now. You know, we uh, Derek and I, as you may know, have been planning a tour to Israel for uh, an arm in arm solidarity mission. Mm-hmm. Just to let everyone over there know that they are not alone. Yeah. We not only pray for them, we still want to support them by going over and helping out their tourism industry. Right. Um, we've been told that the hotels that are normally full at this time of year, as we've seen during our three previous visits, uh, yeah. two of which were in May, uh, boy, it's it's tourists from all over the world. Mm-hmm. North America, China, Africa, lots of Africans going to uh, Israel during a normal season, but this is not a normal season. It, it's the, the hotels that are suffering, uh, the, all of the industries that rely upon tourists. Mm-hmm. You know, you, the, the Bedouin who's walking down the street with you or the Armenian who's walking down the street with you or even the Arab in some cases, trying to find a way to, uh, or a Muslim, I should say, mm-hmm. trying to find a way to make a living. Yeah. Would you like to buy this flag? Would you like to buy this... Uh, A wonderful scarf. Would you like to buy this Armenian uh, Jerusalem cross? Sure, yeah. We've got a couple of those, and I love buying those because it's a way to help support these individuals. Now, you have to be careful because not everybody is selling you what it's worth, but you can often talk them down to, I'll give you a dollar. Yeah, this $20 hat, I'll give you five. Sold! (laughs) But but we want to go over and support them. The restaurants, so many places that rely upon us, not to mention the tour companies like Lipkin Tours. Um, Because of what is going on over there, it is frankly up in the air as to whether or not we will go. Right. We we understand, and we've got some people who have signed up to go. We've got people from three continents Mm -hmm. who have signed up to go. And understand, Derek and I will go. You know, if if the Lord says go, we're ready to go. We're not afraid. We really, really are not. Right, right. It's a case of airlines actually running. Because some airlines, some countries are canceling airlines into mm-hmm. Tel Aviv right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, the airline space over many of these countries is sometimes simply shut down because yeah. of what's... And you never know from one minute to the other when something will happen. Sure. So th- this weekend, we-, we will have to make a decision about the tour. We'll, mm-hmm. we'll know by Monday, Tuesday latest because Passover is, is coming and they've got the Seder coming Monday night. They do, and right now they are finishing Shabbat, so we right. yeah. cannot, we, we've already sent email communiques to Lipkin Tours. We've not heard back because Shabbat began right after our email got Right, there. and uh, Lipkin Tours, our friends there, mm-hmm. are uh, Orthodox Jews, and mm-hmm. so they are Torah observant, and uh, they're just incommunicado until sundown tonight, Saturday, but uh, we should hear from them soon, we expect, because... They need to know, we need to know, mm-hmm. and obviously the folks who have placed their trust in us and in Lipkin Tours need exactly. to know. Exactly. But if you're, if you're inclined to go, I mean, there is still time to sign up. Normally, when you're doing a tour to Israel, uh, you got to have hotel reservations way in advance. Right now, we are told the hotels are very empty mm-hmm. uh, because most of what we're seeing in, through the corporate media right now shows the uh, destruction in, in Gaza. And of course, they look for the most spectacular video uh, to, you know, j- attract clicks mm-hmm. because they're, they're advertiser driven. And so they need eyeballs. There's, there's some video, not to rabbit trail too far, but there's some video showing people on the beach in Gaza actually uh, vacationing. And that's really made some Israeli politicians angry. Itamar Ben Gavir, who is mm-hmm. kind of a gadfly on the uh, cabinet of uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. He is far to the right of Netanyahu complaining. He said, this is just not right. We've got 60,000 people who've been evacuated from their homes in the north, and you've got Gazans who are sunning themselves on the beach. Mm-hmm. So, all right, whatever. 
we pray that everybody could have enough peace that we could all be at the beach sunning ourselves or doing whatever we want to do without fear. We but. have also communicated to Lipkin Tours that if for some reason the decision is no, it's not, uh, we cannot make firm plans to go because it's just two weeks away. Yeah. It, if that cannot take place, may we postpone it. Right. Everyone who's signed up, we would postpone it to October, perhaps, mm-hmm. some sort of fall date where it would be cooler mm-hmm. anyway, but also maybe by then the tensions will have calmed down. Cool. Yeah. So uh, ag- again, if you're interested, you want to send us a note, that's fine. You can uh, email us, Derek at GilbertHouse.org, info at GilbertHouse.org. We'll mm-hmm. get it to us as well. And, and GilbertHouse.org slash travel is where you get all the information. Right. You want to look at the itinerary that's planned and uh, get an idea of cost. All of that's there. There's a link there to go to Lipkin mm-hmm. Tours and reserve your place. So again, we've got uh, a number of brave souls who have committed to this. Mm-hmm. And um, so we, we will make a final decision this weekend, but there's still time is the bottom line, but you've right. got to make a decision this weekend. Right now, for me, it isn't a fear factor. It's geopolitical. It's, it's will right. airlines go? Right. Can we safely be in a hotel in Jerusalem? There are a lot of things taking place. Right. But if you are interested in going to Israel and frankly, you just don't want to go on a tour like this, you want to go on the full archaeological, the full tour that mm-hmm. we take next spring is the one. GilbertHouse.org slash travel will get you there as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, March 25th through April 3rd, the dates with an optional three-day extension to Jordan. And uh, that information is there. And that will be, uh, we will be accompanied on this adventure by our good friends, uh, Doug Van Dorn, Dr. Judd Burton, and Timothy Albarino. I know it's going to be yes. incredible. I can't, I would, look, I, I want to be there. I would go on that I tour. would go on that tour. <laughs> I know, would watch that you, show. You talked about our extension into Jordan and... I just want to thank publicly, thank the King of Jordan for participating. Yeah. Last week, of course, our program was about uh, waiting for the other shoe to drop, waiting for Iran to respond to Israel's uh, alleged, Israel's not confirmed that it did it, but I think everybody pretty much agrees that Israel did hit the consular building next to the embassy in Iran. I know they're calling it the consulate, but really it was an IRGC headquarters and mm-hmm. the IRGC, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, where generals would coordinate activities with militias in Syria and Hezbollah who were striking Israel from the north. So Israel basically said, we're not going to have that anymore. We know that you've got two high-ranking officers there. Boom, done. And Iran responded, of course, last Saturday night after our program went out with 350 drones and cruise missiles, 99% of which reportedly were intercepted whether that's an accurate percentage or not, it appears that only about seven missiles got through, and most of the there mm-hmm. were a couple that got through on the Mount Hermon area, and um, a number that hit an air base in the south that is purportedly where the uh, airstrike against Damascus mm-hmm. launched. I think there's an intelligence operation on Mount Hermon. Right. Yeah. I mean, I mean, highest mountain in the region. You can look into Lebanon. You can look yeah. into Syria. I think that's at this on the Syrian side of the mountain. Uh, it's in Ara- Israeli territory, but you can see v- oh, right. well well into Syria. Uh, there are a number of those on the border mm. where, uh, you know, Mount Bental, uh, Tel Ferez, uh, Tel Saki, where the Israelis have military installations. Go tell it on the mountain. Yeah, yeah. So Saturday night, Iran struck back. Only one casualty, sadly, a seven-year-old Bedouin Arab in uh, girl, little Did girl. Did she die? Uh, no, no. She was last I heard. She was in surgery at mm. a uh, in a, a hospital in uh, Beersheba, I think. So, from the standpoint of damage and casualties, it was minor. But if you were living through it, based on the video, we saw. It's like my dad used to say about medical procedures: minor is when it's happening to somebody else. Mm-hmm. So, our friends there said. Uh, well, Aaron Lipkin posted to his Telegram channel. It was surreal, standing outside on their front porch two o'clock in the morning watching missiles fly overhead. And the video of the missiles being intercepted shot from the Temple Mount. Mm -hmm. Missiles flying over the Dome of the Rock. Exactly. That's apocalyptic. That was, it looked like something from a film. It did. It did. Is it prophetic? We'll talk about that in an upcoming episode of Unraveling Revelation. Um, But uh, we can talk about it now. Well, okay. Mm, if yeah. you want to. But but yeah, Derek and I are going to be recording Unraveling Revelation later. Um, um, but Israel did respond since then. They responded on the 19th, so yesterday, Friday, which 
not coincidentally, perhaps, happened to be Ayatollah Khamenei's birthday, mm. April 19th. He's 85 years old as of yesterday. Yeah. Happy birthday, Ayatollah. Boom. Uh, yeah. But it, it appears... And the day before that was their army day. Right. Where they were all demonstrating and marching. In and, front of the older Khamenei's tomb. Ah. Okay. The original. Yeah. Khomeini and then the Khamenei. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They're going to go through all the vowels and next will be he many, <laughs> who many. Anyway. Uh, uh, it was, uh, it appears that Israel's response was calculated like Iran's response. Let's fling some missiles over there to show them that we can hit them if we want to without doing enough damage to provoke a wider regional war. Now, the area that they hit in uh, Isfahan, south of Tehran, reportedly took out the missile, or rather the radar installation that guards the Natanz nuclear facility. Mm-hmm which is sort of a message like, okay, the radar protecting your nuke plant is now gone. Well, exactly. And I want to remind everybody, if you have forgotten, a couple of weeks ago, the IAEA, Mm -hmm. which is the Nuclear Inspection Organization. International Atomic Energy Authority. They're atomic supermen. They they go in and they're they're, they're supposed to be allowed in there anytime they want to go in Mm -hmm. and inspect. And they had said that it looked like Iran was dangerously close to that point where they could make their own bomb the uranium enriched enough Mm -hmm. yeah fortified with 12 essential vitamins and minerals yeah yeah Yeah. so that was the message sent back does not appear that there were any casualties at least none that iran would admit to in fact iran was not even admitting that israel was responsible but um, do you remember stuxnet yes yes wasn't that deployed at natanz or was it a different facility i would have to look that up I didn't look that up. That was a virus that was uh, put out there some years ago that mm-hmm. really bollocks the works in some of Iran's And it actually facilities. got out in the wild. I think that there were variations of Stuxnet that, that were deployed elsewhere, too. Stuxnet, as I remember, mm-hmm. was probably, um, in, probably infected the system locally. In other words, not through the internet. No, somebody stuck a, a drive and mm-hmm. connected a drive to a computer in, in Iran. Yeah, this was uh, in 2010. We talked about this back then. Yeah. We, we've forgotten a lot of what we've done in this program. We've got more than 2,000 I hours barely remember of yesterday, much less, you know, <laughs> back in 2010, but 15 years oh, ago. Yeah. I mean, 14 years ago. Yeah. Stuxnet had been the development since 2005. This is from the book of all knowledge, <laughs> Wikipedia. And it did damage to Iran's nuclear program. Mm. Although neither company has openly admitted responsibility, quoting now, multiple independent news organizations recognize Stuxnet to be a cyber weapon jointly dis- uh, built by the United States and Israel in a collaborative effort known as Operation Olympic Games. Mm-mm. Okay. The gods of Olympus targeting the Prince of Persia, apparently. That's interesting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm. So anyway, yeah, it was, uh, oh, Okay. I actually know a little bit about these. Stuxnet specifically targets programmable logic controllers. These are devices that allow you to automate um, Mm -hmm. electromechanical processes, Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. big pieces of machinery. Mm -hmm. There was a a short period of time there back in my, back in my Philadelphia days, back in 1987, when I was really bored. I'd been, I'd been demoted from the night shift at the radio station I was working for at the time. Uh, started out as Electric 106. <laughs> There's some YouTube video of me that was an air check of one of my shifts on Electric 106, which is a hot hits format. We were limited to 10 seconds of talk between every record maximum. So it was very, very high energy. Some might call it hyper caffeinated, which in my case was true. Yeah. That's back when Jolt Cola was a thing. Oh All the gosh. sugar and three times the caffeine. Oh. And yeah, I would go through a six-pack of Jolt while I was on the air. Anyway. Um, you digress. I digress. I got, I got pushed back to the uh, late night shift, 10 p.m. to 2 a.m., and they didn't want me doing anything else at the radio station. Because as I later learned, the program director wasn't all that impressed with me, and I eventually got replaced by Danny Bonaducci of the Partridge oh, family. Oh, I remember your time, yeah. yes. Anyway. I w- was looking for something else to do, bring in a little extra cash. I wound up working in sales, the sales department of a company that made programmable logic controllers. They had a new type of PLC that they were marketing. And so I would make phone calls to engineers and say, hey, this is a, a different type of, because 
Anyway, I, I too too long. It was computer controlled, which back in the mid '80s was was still a really new thing. Guys were used to actually having to hardwire the steps in the chain of a PLC mm-hmm. instead of just programming it in using a, a language, computer language like BASIC. Right. This is like a macro. Yeah. So anyway, the, now that they become more uh, complicated, they also become more vulnerable to things like viruses and computer worms, which is what Stuxnet was. Well, of course they do. The more you um, electronify things, mm-hmm. the more likely they are to fail. Let's talk about the Tesla truck. That the guy took through the car wash to get all of the sand off of it because Mm -hmm. he'd been... Off-roading. Yes. And uh, now it's a big Tesla brick. Mm Mm-hmm. I was surprised to find out in that story about the uh, car wash ruining his Cybertruck that Teslas actually have a car wash mode. (laughs) You have to put the car in car wash mode to take it through the car wash. That's ridiculous. What if you... What if it starts raining? Do you have a driving in the rain mode? I guess you must. Shouldn't it be smart enough to figure out that there's water coming? If you're driving off road and you have to go through a creek, what what happens yeah. then? Do you have you know good driving through the creek mode? I yeah. It, mm. th- this is unbelievable. Apparently, there's a there's a, um, a reset mode on the on the uh, dashboard, and according to the guy who tweeted about it or posted to X which ironically is also owned by the guy who owns I Tesla, know. Elon Musk. I'm sure he tagged him on uh-huh. it. Uh-huh. That the, the reboot system just makes a strange popping sound in the dashboard and nothing happens. But then he called the company and said, okay, this is what's going on with my car. They said, oh, you took it through the uh, car wash without putting it in car wash mode? Okay, you voided your warranty. We're not going to cover it. And he's only got 3,000 miles on his Cybertruck, which is what, a $100,000 vehicle? That's ridiculous. It is. It is. Can't take your vehicle through the car wash because it's electric. Yeah, I'll say again. What if you? Yeah, it's electric. Well, the world is full of rain. Yeah. and water. It, it it is. So, what is the purpose of taking that? I, I will say again. I, I posted this to uh, X some weeks ago on another story about uh, I don't know Tesla catching fire or something or or something like uh, the money that was supposed to be sent as spent as part of the infrastructure bill. That Biden passed the uh, let's you know goose inflation now bill or whatever to to put in uh, more charging stations for EVs that most of it hasn't been spent and what little it's been spent has been is spent in high income areas <laughs> like Manhattan and uh, uh, Hollywood you know where they the, the people there are wealthy enough they don't need the government to invest in the infrastructure here in the ozarks we've lived here for nine years Maybe that's electric, how they got so wealthy i guess electric yes they game the system uh electric vehicles are just so impractical i've only seen a couple of teslas and it's only when i go up to springfield or to st louis mm-hmm. but out here in stone county where we live i have not seen a single electric vehicle period I, some hybrids some people drive priuses around mm-hmm. here hybrid kind of makes sense sure but, uh, you know, an all e- electric vehicle when you're living out in the country? Stupid. <clears throat> Stupid. Uh, uh, speaking of Biden. Well, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, right. well let's just get, some, get this out of the way because people are probably expecting us to talk about it. He did a Trump, only not very good, not very well. He went to a fast food restaurant. Yeah, um, to, kind of a convenience store. Uh, oh, that's right. It it's was called a Wawa. To, to, oh. v- very big in Philadelphia. I, I learned that. Is that when like I the there. Wawa pedal that guitarists use? <laughs> I, I am told it is a Native American word for a type of goose, if I understand that correctly. Um, but well, uh, can you still call it that? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't well, know. anyway, the president went into this uh, convenience store to replicate what. Former President Trump had done when mm-hmm. he went into what? What was that? he went into a burger place, didn't he? Trump went into a place in Harlem, yeah, burger place, yeah, and was warmly received, which surprised Very a lot of observers. Warmly received because you wouldn't expect Harlem to be a. It's not exactly MAGA country. No, you know, like Chicago. Yeah, hey, this is MAGA country. But oh, wait, I that think, regardless of your background, you have to be wondering. Does government really care about me? Sure. Unless you're wealthy. Sure, yeah. And so Trump walks in and starts greeting people. And there are a number of examples like that. The, the press underreports. 
like that that 12 year old boy who volunteered you know to help you know the government save money he'd volunteered to come to the white house and mow the lawn oh i remember that That and they brought him up there and trump went out of the white house and talked to this young man who was working hard i mean Mm -hmm. that that to me was like all right maybe it's a staged photo op don't care that that was good optics Mm -hmm. for the president and his advisors if they had suggested it great but trump's got these instincts of connecting with people Mm -hmm. that joe biden does not have when he went into the wawa forbes recorded the pre visit visit trump just okay hey let's just stop here let's go in there no it'll be fine that Biden's team went in advance and scripted to the people behind the, okay, here's how you're going to handle the tip and here's how you're going to do this. And, how you, and when Biden did go in there, they showed, okay, they're doing the thing. He's getting a shake. And now suddenly he's distracted by a display on the counter. And now he's taking the box and he's folding the cover over on top of the box. What are you doing? <laughs> President Biden, what are you doing? It, it was, and, and nobody was really making a fuss. Whereas with with trump going into the store in harlem it was uh and then at some point he started talking about his uncle well yeah and he did this twice mm. uh, i don't know that it was at the the, the wawa but uh it was, was a couple it? of other personal his appearances grandfather, there was a it was his uncle yeah but he went to a memorial of some kind i think and was talking about he mentioned his grandfather robinette was the last name i think of mm-hmm. the grandfather. Uh, but then started in on this uncle story. Yeah, Ambrose Finnegan, who was a, uh, um, as I understand it, he served in some capacity in in World War II. Not quite sure. Let's see. He, hmm, trying to look this up now real quick. Uh, but anyway, the way President Biden told the story, he said that his uncle was shot down on a mission over Papua New Guinea Mm. and in World War II. And it was over the northern part of the island, which was inhabited by cannibals. And so they never found the body. And he repeated the story twice. He made the remarks in Scranton, Pennsylvania, and again in Pittsburgh. So twice he mentioned Uncle Bozy, as they called him, was shot down twice, or was not shot down twice. He mentioned the story twice, that he was Mm -hmm. shot down over New Guinea, while on recon- a, a reconnaissance flights, said he flew single-engine planes and reconnaissance flights. But according to a personnel profile report from the Pentagon, the plane had not been shot down. It ditched. It was not a single-engine plane. It was a... There was a failure. It was a twin-engine plane. Mm-hmm. Both engines failed. The pilot attempted to ditch. It hit nose first, flipped over, and only the engineer on the plane survived. Um, Finnegan was not the pilot so um he did not survive he and he did not survive and they did not recover the body because he was essentially lost at sea he mm-hmm. was not eaten by cannibals but Papua sub- new guinea is not happy no there are uh in fact the daily mail ran a headline quoting a college professor at the university of Papua new guinea saying they would not just eat any white men who fell from the sky <laughs> Oh my gosh. I think we that just That sounds found, like Babylon B. I know. I, I I posted that and somebody to X and somebody made that comment. It took me a minute to realize this was not a Babylon B story. Uh yeah. It, cuz it does sound like a B headline. If you if you're not familiar with the Babylon B, you seriously have to go. They have the best mm-hmm. sense of humor. Babylon B dot com mm. yeah it is it is hilarious and they, they, poke, an and they and poke fun at both at everybody sides, they so do it's the humor is not dead and there's a lot of poking fun at the body of christ because this yeah. is a uh, i i assume they're all christians that work there i can't yes. guarantee that but they tend to look at the world with a christian worldview yes and therefore everybody gets they, skewered and they they spun off a sister website by the way called not the com, which are began with uh, as a place to post stories that are so bizarre you'd think that they were parody but they're not like this one like this one like uncle Bosey. and uh, it's turned out to be a pretty valuable news source because they do and they do present things from a christian perspective but with a sense of humor so uh, let me uh, just now, I, I okay go ahead i was just while we're talking about papua new guinea i just want to make it clear that that is a strategic location mm-hmm. and 
the United States has been trying to diplomatically open channels for bases and trade Mm -hmm. with Papua New Guinea. And they are failing to make those inroads because China is outbidding them. So this sort of comment Mm -hmm. isn't helping. No, it is not. Uh, Papua New Guinea is on an island north of Australia, mm-hmm. so it's key to the Western Pacific. Yes, it is. Yeah, about 9 million people there. This is interesting. 283 languages on that uh, little section of the island. The most linguistically diverse place on Earth. Wow. Yeah, but they are not happy with President Biden, so diplomats are having to work overtime now to... to no, he did not call Papua New Guinea a bunch of cannibals. Well, yeah, yeah he kind, he of kind of did. Of, kind of did. Now, it, it would be easy to mock President Biden for this. And I, I want to make it clear that I am not doing that because anyone with a family member who is suffering from dementia, and my mother is, mm-hmm. she's a little and I further. I know some of you who are, yep. you know, out there, you, you also are dealing with this. It's very difficult. And you would, I would never suggest that your mother be put in charge of a corporation, no, much no, less a country. No. And that is, that's the thing here. Um, President Biden appears to be going through what mom was going through a few years ago with uh, the, the nurses called uh, sunsetting. Mm. The, the, Lots the, the of hallucinations boundary, right, and false memories. Boundary between reality and imagination mm. is thinning. thinning and uh, Maybe th- th- this story may be absolutely real to President Biden. The fact that he repeated it mm-hmm. suggests that he wasn't trying to tell a story just to impress people, that he, he may well believe that this is real. Mm-hmm. But he should not have been allowed in this position. His family should have stepped in. Jill should have stepped in. Hunter should have stepped in. James Biden, his brother, should have stepped in and said, look, Joe is not well enough to handle the stress which will exacerbate these symptoms. I'd like to think that they care enough about him that they would do that. But, but I just think it's, it's tragic because why would you put your love, beloved family member into such a difficult position? Because mm-hmm. I doubt that there are days when I, I can't imagine him truly being happy. You wouldn't think so. Uh, that, that office is very stressful. We, we've mm-hmm. noticed over the past 25 years, 26 years of our marriage, that uh, every president who goes into office comes out with a lot more gray than he went in with. Mm-hmm. Now, maybe it's just that's the age when you become president, you're in that transition phase from brown to gray. I, I yeah, think it's stressful. I think it's stress. I do. And uh, it's not helpful for somebody who's already dealing with cognitive decline to mm-hmm. have to endure that kind of stress. He, he, but he was the least offensive candidate that the Democrats had with name recognition to the country in 2000, uh, 2020, that is, when they were trying to put up somebody to stop Trump from getting reelected. I mean, the other... The, I'm, the, I'm smiling because what you said, he was the least offensive candidate. So what you're saying is all of your other candidates are very offensive to your voters. Maybe you should rethink your position. Well, it, exactly. The, the candidates that were most popular among Democrats, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, I mean, come on. <laughs> no chance yeah so they had to and as as we saw in 2016 hillary clinton she was the she had the most power in the party which is how she got the nomination in 2016 but she was the least likable candidate they could have put up mm-hmm. and they squeezed bernie sanders out used dirty tricks to do it mm-hmm. but bernie sanders was not he's so far to the left that uh, independent voters who swung the election who swing every election really you've got a hardcore left hardcore right they're going to vote for the party candidates Democrat, Republican, whoever they put up, but you get the people in the middle, you need to persuade. And Biden was the least offensive to the middle. Mm. But as is clear, in fact, this would just came out within the last couple of days, James O'Keefe, who founded Project Veritas. Now Mm. he's got uh, O'Keefe Media Group. He got squeezed out, didn't he? Yeah. The board of directors, he allowed a board of directors in and they voted him out after he uh, went after the corporations that must not be named responsible for a lot of what's happened the last four years. Uh, his new media company, acronym OMG. <laughs> yeah, O'Keefe <laughs> Media Group. He just dropped some video within the last 24 hours showing who's really manipulating things behind the scenes in the White House. The um, White House uh, chief of staff, 
is essentially the most powerful person in Washington or inside the White House, more powerful than Kamala Harris. Hmm. And I forget the fellow's name, but the chief of staff is essentially, if, if you, Jeff Zents, Z-I-E-N-T-S, um, if he, he's basically the gatekeeper to the president and he sets the agenda. That would be every chief of staff, though. In a sense, yeah, but uh, Biden basically, as we've seen in a number of press conferences, well, they told me I can't take any questions, or here's my list of people I have to call on. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm going to get in trouble for saying this, but that there's more truth to that than the White House would like to admit. Biden mm. is basically being scripted, and as we saw at the Wawa, here's who you're going to talk to, here's what you'll say, here's what they'll say to you. And Look, this is his final year of mm-hmm. this term. If he were to win again this fall, Mm -hmm. there is no way. I'll be surprised if he makes it through the summer. Yeah. And Democrats are really panicked about that because they've seen what Kamala Harris is like now for the last four years. Her team and the Biden team don't get along. She was so unlikable in her home state of California that she dropped out of the primaries before the California primary. She was polling at like 3% in her home state. So uh, she's not going to... Yeah. For those who are not my own... As old as I am. You young whippersnappers out there, you may not remember what happened and how we ended up with a President Ford. Gerald Ford, right? Gerald Ford was not elected. Mm -hmm. He was put into the VP position because uh, Agnew, Spiro Agnew, was drummed out for a scandal. Mm -hmm. He was the VP to Nixon. So when Nixon bowed out under Uh very mild pressure in today's, you know, definitions, he bowed out and Therefore, Ford went into the vice, into the president, and right. the VP became Rockefeller. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the deep two s- unelected people running the country. The deep state engineered that. Yes, and my I point f- is. So, I see where you're going. Mm-hmm. Yep, same thing yep. is shaping up in. There, they may even try to shoehorn Biden out before, even though he's. The, the, that would mean that Harris goes in. The, but they'll find a way to get her out, too, because mm. they know she's not electable. Mm. So Let's do a Venn diagram. Then. Yeah. <laughs> she loves Venn diagrams. She does. Well, it's going to be interesting. As Christians, we just need to remember that we are not depending on the ballot box for our salvation. So just get your popcorn and remember, uh, we're, th- this is a show. Yes, it affects our daily lives. But at the end of the day, it only happens, all that happens is only what God allows. Amen to that. Yeah. Well, let's take a break. We'll tell you about how to uh, take advantage of some 40% off deals on our books. Woo-hoo. We'll talk about our coffee and uh, coming up, how uh, Apple and Google are collaborating to build Skynet. Oh. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> when PID Radio continues. Summer reading season is just around the corner. We want to help you get ready. You can buy fiction. You can buy nonfiction through the Gilbert House store. Whichever you want. All of our books are 40% off. 40%. That includes all eight novels of the Red Wing Saga. Book nine is coming probably early summer. My two novels. And then, of course, all of our nonfiction stuff, Mm -hmm. including our most recent books, Giants, Gods, and Dragons, The Second Coming of Saturn, and Veneration, a deep dive into the cult of the Nephilim. April and May, you get 62 days. No, 61. That's, April only has 30. <laughs> Regardless, through the end of May, 40% off on all of our books at the Gilbert House store. Available only online. Go to gilberthouse.org slash store. You'll find all the prices slashed on our books. 40% off. Gilberthouse.org slash store. And thank you for your prayers and support. Welcome back to PID Radio. I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert, and I need more coffee. Well, it just so happens, Mrs. Gilbert, we have some. What? Yes, at the Gilbert House store, gilberthouse.org slash store, coffee from Kevlar Joe's Coffee. Ooh, that's good coffee. Yes, it is. Three, three varieties, small batch roasted by hand, veteran-owned company right mm-hmm. here in our beautiful state of Missouri. Uh, Nick Fisher and his team, at uh, which is, I think, Nick... <laughs> Kevlar it's like Joe's us coffee. and our team, which That's is right. the dogs. Yeah. 
We've three blends. We've got the uh, the flavored blend, cookies and cream flavored, uh, called Amazing Grace, based on the black and white coat of Grace the Rescue Dog. There's Snarling Dachshund, which is actually very smooth, like Sam was a smooth coated, uh, you know, Dachshund. Yeah, black Sumatra and tan, beans. Sumatra beans, and then the uh, Derek's Bunker Buster, which is the dark roast Colombian. All three of those you'll find at gilberthouse.org slash coffee. Links take you to Kevlar Joe's and he will ship directly from his site. So it's fresh, good stuff. It is such good coffee. And by the way, we've just signed with another affiliate. Yes. Uh, this is Simply Clean Foods. Chance Gibson. We've been seeing him at the Hear the Watchman conferences for years. In fact, I and, interviewed. And tasting his. And tasting his. Yes. Samples. He has been doing this for some time now. In fact, they they rebranded the company a little while back. It was uh, American Patriot Supply, I think. But uh, anyway, it's Simply Clean Foods, simplycleanfoods.net. We've got a box ad for it at uh, gilberthouse.org, but we're going to put a banner ad up there and put one in the sidebar so it's a little easier to find. Basically, what they do is this, freeze-dried foods, so it's long, long-term long storage, but it's all guaranteed 100% GMO-free. Yes. And also you can put a link in the program notes for this. Uh, yeah. Well, I can, can't I? What? Uh, I don't have to just copy and paste from last week? Oh, Whoa. no. no. Oh, no you, writing is no. hard. I, trust me, it really is. You know, speaking of writing, you and I just turned in, much of it fell to you, tr- just finished turning in the manuscript for the Gates of Hell, mm-hmm. which means that I can now start writing the... Uh, book nine of the Red Wing Saga series. But I have to tell you, it takes energy to not just physical energy, but mental energy to, uh, to write and to think clearly and to plot. And there are days, I'll be honest with you, I'm just so tired. Mm. And part of it is having dogs. I'm still getting used to <laughs> raising this puppy. She's three and a half months or so now, and she's coming along. I yeah, have to say, yeah. she's really coming along. She's fun. She is such a fun, energetic, loving puppy. And she and Grace get along really, really well. And they both love going to our groomers when uh, every Friday they go there for a play date and Mm -hmm. she keeps them when we're out of town. But I'm finding that my, I'm still trying to find my groove, if you want to put it that way, for writing when I can best do it as far as my energy level, my creativity. So I apologize. Things are delayed, but I'll get there. Mm. And right now I'm thinking probably late July by the time it comes out, but I will keep you updated as to how many pages I've written. (laughs) We'll get there. But the Gates of Hell is now in the editor's hands. Mm -hmm. He has begun work on it. He's already uh, (laughs) informed me that I'd forgotten to uh, include citations for some of the quotes in the first chapter. So I went back and uh, grabbed those and supplied those to him. I wondered about that. Um, The other thing is that we need to write a dedication in a forward if, if necessary, but um, this should be out fourth quarter, by the way, when, when uh, you finish the first draft going through and editing that it had a lot of footnotes. In fact, <laughs> there were 666. of them. Yes. Well, we now have 676. So and when there. I added, added a few more that I sent to him, it's probably going to be closer to 685. Can so. we get to 700? <laughs> Do I hear 700 out there? <laughs> so we will, uh, we will keep you posted on the progress there. We do have a cover design, which is wonderful. The oh, it's awesome so Jeffrey Martis has developed. This is his best cover yet. It really is. He designs all the covers for Defender and for us. He designed the cover for Tom Horn's last book, mm-hmm. which I think is just perfect. Summoning, Summoning the, the Demon. Demon. Yes. Yeah. It is very timely. Mm-hmm. And, you know, another reference to Elon Musk. That's the quote, which you included in one of the chapters mm-hmm. for... Uh, the gates of hell um, I summoning, think summoning the, demon. the dragon is what i actually put but yes summoning the demon is but that, that's that, the quote but you the included quote. the you included the quote mm-hmm. where he said uh pe- creating artificial intelligence is summoning, summoning the, the demon. demon it's like the guy summoning the go demon ahead and do it yeah try to think he could control it yeah it didn't work out too because well because the demon doesn't know that there's a car wash mode <laughs> yeah. is there a car wash mode on the ai <laughs> I don't know. Is the AI yeah. in the room with you now? But speaking, well, probably yes. yes. And that's the, that's the whole problem. And that leads to the next story, thanks to uh, Patrick Wood at uh, technocracy.news. If you're not familiar with the term technocracy, you need to learn it. Essentially, this is a, it's a worldview, it's a political system, it's really kind of a religion. 
that's been around for the last 90 years where technocrats believe that the only way to really run human civilization is by allowing engineers and bureaucrats and scientists to control everything because they alone have the expertise and the knowledge and the intelligence to properly quantify, analyze, and distribute all the resources necessary for maximum human utility. Which is exactly why we opened the gates of hell with a fictional yeah. um, scenario that posits that very, exactly. where, where it will end up right. if an AI is in charge of the world. We, yeah, the book basically goes from ancient times and the earliest efforts we can document through historical through archaeology, through written records, to open the gates of hell, to contact the entities on the other side. Really, all that AI is doing and the attempt to create AI, artificial or autonomous AI, is uh, just using technology to do it. But really, the ancients, uh, Gobekli Tepe, Gilgal, Rephaim, Stonehenge, it's just using the, tech, the cutting-edge technology of 5,000, 10,000, 15,000 years ago. So, uh, but now we are bringing, yes, is the AI in the, AI in the room with you right now? Mm-hmm. Yes, it is. Uh, wearables, smartphones, fitness trackers, smartwatches, got an Apple watch, um, Apple air tags, ring doorbells, your hearing aid, perhaps they all use low energy Bluetooth or Bluetooth LE. Our new fridge. Our new fridge, yes, has Wi-Fi. I know. Now I don't know if it has Bluetooth or not, but it does have Wi-Fi that we I haven't looked to see if there's a way to shut it off. I assume there is. Yeah. But you can see it when you go to all the various places where you can we'll get, get on the, the manual and shut yeah. it off. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because this is how a lot of hackers will get access to a home mm-hmm. network and then get into your computer. They'll find a fridge, a, a, a fridge or, or a, a TV printer. or printer, mm-hmm. which a lot of us, you know, like with our fridge, we've had for several weeks now and we've not changed the password on it. Don't even know if it has a password. The password might be yeah. password. But the Bluetooth LE is an independent mesh, work, mesh network that is not dependent on the internet. It is a mesh network separate and independent from the internet. Um, I want to remind everybody of a story that you and I talked about many, many, many years ago. I think we were still in St. Louis. Mm-hmm. And it was uh, a system of creating a local network with right. dust. Right, right, right. And it was even called dust. Seriously, moats. Yeah. Well, this is essentially that. Uh, AI running on massive computers, but uh, is is what's made this BLE or Bluetooth low energy mesh network possible. Blah. Yeah, blah. BLE, it's blah. (laughs) Any device you get close to, if you've got a device that's got Bluetooth on it, your smartphone, your Apple Watch, your uh, fitness tracker. It will shake hands. It will shake hands. They could disclose the frequency, length of contact, other subsequent contacts you make, Apple AirTags, you're tagging your luggage with it. You, that's, the whole point is you're tracing where it is in real time. Contact tracing, for example, which became a term we were all suddenly familiar with in 2020, made possible mm. by Bluetooth Low Energy, BLE. So during a future outbreak, perhaps, our movements can be tracked. And we're finding out now several years after the fact, that that, in fact, was what governments were doing. The United States government, state governments, were tracking people in real time without our knowledge or consent, using devices like this. And as we deploy more Internet of Things devices, we we basically are hooking ourselves willingly into what will become the equivalent of Skynet. You and I, we were just recently at a conference in Dallas, the Hear the Watchman conference, and we were honored to be asked to participate in the filming of a music video with <laughs> Pastor Casper McLeod That's right. and its watchers. Yeah. And it's the idea that you're constantly being watched, but his song doesn't necessarily mean government, mm-hmm. even though, yes, he does discuss that many, many times in his uh, various songs and in his preaching. Mm-hmm. But he's talking about spiritual watchers, and they don't need a Bluetooth mesh. No. No, they're, they're looking from the unseen realm mm-hmm. and watching, right? I have to say, though, Paul Begley, <laughs> because a number of us who were there were asked to participate, and so we're, Derek and I are in for any, just about anything. Sure, we'll do it. 
But Paul Begley, we'd not seen him record his, so when we watched the final video, I thought I was going to bust a gut yeah. laughing because he is so over-the-top wonderful. Yeah, Paul was, I think, the star of that video. He was the star. I'm sorry, Casper. I'm sorry, Renee Truex. But Paul Begley stole the show. He did. He did. You can find that at Casper's um, YouTube channel. In fact, I will post a link to that in the show notes. And the song is catchy. You're going to find yeah. yourself. It's almost an earworm. <laughs> it's, in that you hear, it's in your head all day long. Casper has a gift. Back in the 80s, when I was a, uh, in the radio business, Top 40 Radio, music director at a couple of stations, well, one station, program director of another, it was my job to listen to music and find the ones that would become hits. And uh, Casper's writing style fits that sort of mid-80s, early 90s power pop genre. Mm -hmm. And he can write a hook, but he includes some really great lyrics. And some great theology, too. One of my favorites is Nimrod's head is... <laughs> Nimrod's head remains in a jar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah, some great stuff. So, uh, back to uh, Israel for just a moment, because uh, overnight, uh, yesterday into this morning, uh, after you went to bed last night, news popped on social media of a, uh, a strike of some sort, or an attack of some sort, on um, the Popular Mobilization Front, or PMF, which are Shia militias backed by Iran in Iraq. Oh, was that this a the Baghdad south, Yeah, south of Baghdad mm -hmm. that were attacked. Now, the Pentagon said, yes, we can confirm that this is going on, but no, we didn't do it. But then an Israeli official came out and said, no, it's not us either. Hmm. So, because the, the first thought was, okay, here we go, Israel hit Iran with sort of a pinprick assault, took, taking out, we believe, the radar installation guarding their nuclear facility at Natanz. But now the next day, these, uh, militia, this militia base south of Baghdad mm -hmm. got, got hit. So the thought was that Israel had launched another attack. But Israel, uh, at, at least an Israeli official, said, no, that wasn't us. So then the question becomes, all right, what exactly is going on there? It looks to me, I'm, I'm going through the X feed right now on, on just with Iraq as the search term, and it looks to me like most people, and these are being um, Shia Muslims, mm -hmm. are blaming Israel. They're saying Israel did it, even though Israel has right. not said, they're very good about saying, yes, by the way, we did that. Mm -hmm. They still have not confirmed that they were the ones that hit the, I know, that's why you see the headlines, allegedly. Right, on April 1st, that uh, strike in Damascus. But in, in this case, they, they, didn't, they haven't denied that strike either. But the one, in, the one in Baghdad, they've, uh, an official came out and said, no, it wasn't us. Mm -hmm. hmm. Let me suggest, and this is just speculation because I don't see anything on social media to, to back this up. Speculating now, what if the Islamic State did this. Why would the Islamic State do it? Well, the Islamic State is a violent Sunni Muslim group mm -hmm. who back in early January issued a long screed through social media, through its official news outlet, the Amuk News Agency, basically condemning everybody who's not them from the government of Iran because they're Shia and so they're heretics to Hamas because their struggle is not for the glory of Allah. It's to build a, a nation state. And Muhammad never said anything about building nation states. Uh, so ISIS is not in support of Hamas. ISIS is not in support of the Shias, but not in support of Israel or the United States either. So my, my thought is, what if they did this to try to provoke a war between Iran and Israel? Mm -hmm. Oh, in fact, I agree with you. My quiet, I had my hand raised. I know. Um, because I wanted to ask you if ISIS is homogenous. You've got a lot of variant splinter groups of ISIS. Are they all run by the same I have, head? I have no way to know. I don't know. I know. For that, instance, ISIS K. Right. If that is even allegedly exists. Behind, yes, is allegedly behind the bombing in Russia. Mm hmm. Don't know. Or not. 
Yeah, I guess yeah, he did bomb Moscow, too. Yeah. Right. That that's who was blamed. Well, so there was a shooting, but there was also a bombing. Right. And and of course the Russians don't buy that. They said, isn't it interesting that uh, they was blamed on ISIS K within hours? How could the Americans possibly know this? I like, know. Mm, mm, don't know. We're we're in a but, war of words, and this is. Uh, part of the theopolitics and here's the other thing about isis i I talked about this on five and ten two maybe three weeks ago um there are those in syria and iraq some of these shia backed militias what are you hearing oh maybe it's that the fan Uh, yeah must be be. because i I thought gosh (laughs) is chris out there mowing (laughs) (laughs) yeah there's a there's a low hum from the uh, ceiling fans no, no, it's not ceiling fans. It sounds like a mower. I I don't hear it. Anyway. Yeah. The only hum I hear is from the... Oh, uh, well, maybe the, that's the, what the, it is. The little drinks fridge over there. Yeah, it sounds like a distant uh, <laughs> tractor. When you live in the country, you get used to hearing those. It's like yeah. either someone's got a yard tractor out or it's a big tractor. Uh-huh. Because we've had... Uh, our, our hay fields are growing up, and I thought, that can't be you that cut it, No, not it's too early to cut the hay yet, but uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of mowing going on these days. Um, anyway, uh, the Islamic State is um, a, a violent Sunni group that um, basically hates everybody who's not them. And there are Shias in Syria and Iraq, backed by Iran, who've been fighting against the Islamic State for... Well, when did the when did ISIS declare its caliphate? Twenty fifteen, June of twenty fifteen. They believe the United States has facilitated the movement of ISIS, the the few remaining ISIS units from Syria across the border into Iraq. Now, hmm. I have no way to vet that to corroborate it, but given that we were backing the so called moderate rebels in Syria, and I say we, the United States government under Obama, was backing the moderate rebels in Syria uh, by some accounts, sending them the weapons that had been retrieved from the stores piled up by Muammar Gaddafi after Gaddafi was taken yes, down. but the U.S. has a long history of backing all sides. Yeah. Divide and conquer. Mm-hmm. Right. Which is what uh, Netanyahu is accused of. Oh, he set up, he set up Hamas. No, he didn't. Hamas is the military wing of the Muslim Brotherhood, but it served Israel's purpose to weaken the Palestinian Authority under Yasser Arafat and then Mahmoud Abbas's successor by allowing Hamas to take control of, uh, of Gaza after Israel withdrew in 2005. And then Hamas basically staged a coup in Gaza and took it over, violently killed a lot of Fatah uh, members. Uh, Israel didn't intervene because they say, okay, well, if the, uh, if these guys are fighting with each other, there it's less energy. They're spending fighting us. That's that, you know, so people are saying that Netanyahu funded and set up Hamas are just historically unaware. Up in the head. Yeah. Unaware. And that is what the United States has done in Syria with these so-called moderate rebels. You know, the ones who were beheading teenagers and uh, burning people alive. And uh, that Jordanian pilot who was mm-hmm. put in a cage and then d- that, that made King Abdullah of Jordan so angry, he put on a flight suit and was ready to go fly a plane and start strafing himself. His what, daughter what? flies a plane. I saw that. And, and as you mentioned earlier, God bless King Abdullah, the, the, the Jordanian Air Force knocked down a bunch of drones coming from Iran. They refused mm-hmm. to say, so, well, no, we're not going to let you guys just fly across our territory and, and strike Israel. There seems to be an alliance on the down low. The Abraham Accords may not be officially enforced, and I know that the Biden administration, is, not the rabbit trail, but I, I just do not understand the Democrats under O'Biden cozying up to Iran at the expense of the Sunnis in the region. I, I just, I, I do not. That, yeah, I, I don't, that behavior I don't goes way back. That, that cozying up to Iran prior to the revolution mm-hmm. in 1979. Right. There was cozying up to Iran. Yeah. There is now a movement to put the heir to the throne, the... Yeah, the Shah. The, yeah, the Shah who was deposed and now gone on, his heir mm-hmm. 
the, I, where does he live? England? England. There's a, there's a movement to try to get him on the throne again. We saw that video this morning watching GB mm-hmm. News, mm-hmm. a pro-Israel Referring demonstration. Referring to him as king of Iran. Right. Yeah. It was like, why is that Iranian flag there? Who's that? Oh, oh okay. Clean-shaven guy, king of Iran? Hmm. All right. Yeah. A lot of young people in Iran, according to, uh, well, according to Ali Siadatan and, and some others, very much opposed to the old men running the theocracy there. So it will be interesting to see what happens in Iran in the next few years. It's also interesting considering that our government tends to be playing all sides, including the Iranian side. Yeah. And that is that uh, Netanyahu didn't tell the U.S. until the very last minute that he yeah. was about to launch. Yeah. Yeah. Also interesting that uh, Netanyahu did not ask for permission. He just, just did, did it. it. But again, it was a more measured response that I know was uh, hoped for by some of the right-wing uh, members of his cabinet, like Ben Gvir. And in the meantime, we've got Zelensky in Ukraine that's popping up. Yeah, in the dock. Saying, bounce, yeah, uh, bounce. yeah, exactly. Notice me. Mm-hmm. Give me money. Pass that bill so I get lots which, of money. Which he may get. Um, Speaker, House Speaker Mike Johnson basically pushed through the $95 billion that um, the Senate bill passed, mm. which is what the White House wants. This is $60 billion for Ukraine, about $25 billion for Twenty-six billion for Israel, eight billion for Ukraine, eight billion for Taiwan. Excuse mm. me. Uh, the story here's got a typo. I didn't even here. mention Taiwan. Good grief! There are so many things going on down there right now. Right, right. But what uh, Speaker Johnson did is to take the Senate bill and divide it up into four separate bills: the bill for, with money for Ukraine, one for Israel, one for uh, Taiwan, and then a fourth bill that rolled a bunch of things together. And then using a procedural gimmick to tie them all together again and send it back over to the Senate. They, they call it a MIRV, multiple independently targeted re-entry vehicle, like a, like a missile, a nuclear missile with multiple warheads. So does it fly over on a MIRV, Griffin? <laughs> uh, oh yeah. Terrible. So the, the house was not going to pass the bill because the uh, conservatives in, in the house said, look, we, we, another $60 billion for Ukraine when we're not spending anything to defend our southern border. 10 million people have crossed the border in the last three years, but you're going to send another $60 billion to Ukraine in a, lo- in a losing cause. Why is Johnson, does he want to lose his job? Well, I don't know. He probably has been promised some things that even if he, and he appears to be a good man. Oh well, yeah, I, I, I think he is he, a good man too. It's just, why are you making these decisions? I don't. I don't know. But Marjorie Taylor Greene, representative from Georgia, has already filed a motion to vacate mm-hmm. the chair. They, she, she's just not done the next step, which requires a vote on that. Mm. Um, with the resignation yesterday, effective yesterday, of a representative from Wisconsin, Republican Mike Gallagher, the, Johnson can only lose like two Republican votes if the Democrats do what they did previously. And oh, all vote to vacate. Yeah, right. And you've already got Marjorie Taylor Greene and now Representative uh, Thomas Massey of Kentucky. And I think Chip Roy of Texas may be, a, I, I'm not sure where he stands on that. I know Matt Gates has said he wants to keep Johnson. Gates is the one who forced Kevin McCarthy out. Mm. But there are other conservative Republicans who are like, look, we didn't want this. Why are we, because they passed the omnibus bill with all the pork spending that the White House wanted under mm-hmm. Johnson. Mm-hmm. And now they've got these bills that were split, voted, approved separately, now put back together, sent over to the Senate. Um, it's sort of like, okay, this is like the deep state reveal. Somehow Johnson was part of the deep state or he's been gotten to by the deep. Don't know, don't know. But um, more billions for foreign wars. Mm. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm all in favor of sending the, the money to Israel. And it's not just, not just because... God said, you know, I will bless those who bless thee and curse those who curse thee. No, just setting that aside and looking at who Israel is opposed by in that region. Mm-hmm. Violent Islamists are a, an existential threat to the world, if, not just to Israel. If you were to remove Israel from that map, 
the West would have no recourse. It would end up with a West versus East yeah. war. Yeah. There are places in Europe where they still remember this. Mm-hmm. And there are places in Europe that are dealing with what it means to invite millions of Muslims into your, your country. There are no-go zones in France and Sweden, Denmark, where you just... But th- they still remember what it was like having to fight off the mu- armies of Islam in places like Hungary and Poland. Uh, the Sa- Austrians, you would think, would remember. Yes. Well, Sadiq Khan, who is the mayor of London, mm-hmm. has said... That white men don't represent, white Christian men don't represent London. <laughs> well, he's right, sadly. I know, that's but, my point. Yeah. So many outsiders, if you want to put it that way, people from other countries and other religions, uh-huh. other faiths. England has traditionally been a Christian nation, but it is changing yeah. over. Uh-huh. As far as the, the, the way it's represented, and by this I mean what Sadiq Khan said. Mm-hmm. The fact is, I think that there are still a lot of Christians, and I will call them cultural or sociological right, right. Christians. They aren't necessarily born again believers, right? But they wouldn't call themselves Jews or Muslims. Mm-hmm. They would say, "No, I'm a Christian. Come from a Christian family." Yeah, because I'm not Hindu or Buddhist. Yes, exactly. Or, yeah. Because I'm not one of the others. Right. But uh, if you actually look at the demographics, those who identify as Christian overwhelmingly right. outnumber right. everybody else. The funny thing is, when John Cleese several years ago said that London isn't English anymore, he was roundly vilified in the press. How dare you say such a racist thing? Well, and now Sadiq Khan says it. It's like, oh yeah, yeah, oh, absolutely. Oh yeah, we can. Mm-hmm. You get. We have to allow him to say it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> He's not an old white guy. We can't let. <laughs> but uh, before we leave, the whole purpose of PID Radio, Peering into Darkness Radio, is that we look at the spirits behind things. Not only the geopolitics, but also the theopolitics. So taking a look at what's going on in the Middle East right now, Mm -hmm. how does this dovetail with Bible prophecy? That is, that is the question. And in fact, that was something I was going to get to uh, previously talking about, as you mentioned, the White House and- I circled that. Yes. Thank you for circling back. The um, United States government the deep state here in the U.S., has a long history of trying to play both sides. Since World War II, we, we've sort of taken it upon ourselves that we must spread democracy, or at least that's how it's branded for the world. It's not really. It's, it's essentially a continuation of the empire that never ended, which is Rome. We are mm-hmm. spiritual Rome, and that's the point that we make in uh, Second Coming of Saturn and the forthcoming book, The, uh, uh, the Gates of Hell. The imagery inside the United States Capitol conveys that sense that we are linguistically, well, not linguistically, but uh, in terms of our, our law, our art, our architecture, architecture, our, our philosophy, but most of all, spiritually, mm-hmm. the Western world is Rome. And that's why we argued in Giants, Gods, and Dragons that uh, the rider on the white horse in Revelation 6 is Apollo who went forth conquering and to conquer. And his conquest was spreading these ideals of Rome, which was you know, subject to its two high gods, Jupiter and Saturn, Satan and Shemiyaza, mm-hmm. has been transferred first to Western Europe through, the, through England and then on to the United States. Mm-hmm. And that is where we are today. So when you get these really smart boys in Washington, D.C., meddling in affairs elsewhere, and thinking we're going to play both sides against the middle, they're really just doing the bidding of Satan, who from a very high mountain, Mount Hermon, said to Jesus, I control all of these, Mm -hmm. and I'll give them all to you if you just bow the knee to me. That's what's going on here. And we need to remember that, that these governments, including here in the United States, which we Americans like to fancy is a Christian nation, are subject to the God of this world, Satan, i.e. Zeus, i.e. Jupiter, i.e. Baal. That's who is in temporary control of this. But you, we as Christians, we are, we are the resistance. Yes. In a way, we're the men of the West. We are the men of the West outside the gates of Mordor. Mm-hmm. And we are fighting a holding action until our Savior comes over the hill mm-hmm. with the cavalry, the heavenly host. Yep. And that will happen. That day is coming. Yes. That day is coming. Um, Speaking of the idea of the Greco-Roman Empire still being alive mm-hmm. and uh, that we represent it, you have, a, you have plans 
to do a follow-up to your Saturn book. Yep, yep. Going to dig deeper into it. I was doing, trying to do some reading on uh, Constantino Bramidi. Oh, yes. He's, he's the Greek artist who painted the apotheosis of Washington inside the, the Capitol Dome. He did work at the Vatican before he came over in 1849, when he was, uh, I think, in his mid-40s. The French came in and occupied Rome. And because he was, he had been uh, part of the guard that tried to keep the, the French out. They, they basically kicked him out. And so he emigrated. He said, all right, we'll let you live, but you got to leave the country and never come back. So he came to the United States. He met the architect at the Capitol and uh, they were impressed with his work. And so they hired him to paint the, uh, the fresco inside the Capitol Dome, showing George Washington becoming a god. I'd like to know more about Brumidi and what he did for the Vatican. Mm. And, uh, Good question. Because even though this was painted in 1865, long after George Washington's death and long after the uh, Capitol was designed and built, and then rebuilt after the Brits burned it in the War of 1812. Was it part of the original intention in the late 18th century to create this architectural representation of the, the return of old Saturn to his proper place in the cosmos? Well, that can't be answered in two or three minutes, no, but uh, that's, you are going to explore the, that. Yeah, that's going to be the uh, theme of the book. And before we sign off, the one last thing I want to say is today is April 20th. Mm-hmm. Which, if you know your history, is Hitler's birthday. Mm. He was born in 1889, April 20th. Uh, It is not coincidental that the Sinclair twins were also born in 1889. Mm. There's a reason for Mm -hmm. that. But uh, 25 years ago today, Columbine. Oh, right, 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 right. right. Yeah. The shooters. Mm -hmm. uh, They were aware of that as well. Well, yeah, it's... uh, 1999. This is why we do what we do. Peering into darkness. Not to glorify it, not to, not to stir up fear. Because remember, none of this happens where God says, boy, that, I, I didn't expect that. No, no the Lord always, all of it. absolutely. And he allows. Though some, some, sometimes the fallen realm is given permission, as we see in Job. Yeah. Okay, you can go down and test him. Mm-hmm. And just as in the Lord of the Rings where they could not see what exactly was going to happen, but they knew, okay, if we keep moving in this direction, keep fulfilling our mission faithfully, Mm -hmm. then ultimately good will win. If we keep climbing these rocks, if we, you know. One rock at a time. One rock at a time. I can't carry your burden for you, but I can carry you. Yes. Mm -hmm. One of the best scenes in, in film. Yeah. Boy, Sean Astin deserved an Oscar for that award. Mm-hmm. But anyway, um, yeah, so be not afraid. Our Lord has seen all of this and uh, here's the exciting thing and the thing that should really get you inspired. He placed you here now at this point in the history of the world for his purposes. Yes. It may be a small role, but as in Lord of the Rings, the smallest played the biggest part. Yes. Until next time, I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert. Bye-bye, everybody. PID Radio is produced by Gilbert House and released under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License. Follow us online, Twitter, at PID Radio, or the PID Radio page at Facebook. Join us each week for our online Bible study, the Gilbert House Fellowship, online at gilberthouse.org.